And let me tell you, I hung in there and I graduated, matriculated on to different places, pastored in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and two different conferences. And now I'm a religion and theology professor at a school called Oakwood University. Some of, some of you may have heard that of school before, um, teaching on the tenets of Adventist theology and the writings of Ellen G. White, and we're having a wonderful time doing that. Amen. We just want to give God the praise for that. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. Amen. Are you excited for Jesus? Amen. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Yeah. Are you faithful in all that you do? A lot of God's ready. That's what the songwriter says, right? Amen. We're going to talk about some good stuff today. Today we're going to talk about will the real seven-day Adventist please stand up? Amen. I mean, it's time for us to be real seven-day Adventists. Amen? Amen? The Bible says there are wheat and there are tares, there are sheep and there are goats. The Bible says there are saints, and sad to say you have some ain'ts out there. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But what happens is simply is this, that the real seven-day Adventists is going to step up their life in prayer. Amen? They will have a true communion with Jesus. They'll have a true spiritual life, seeking God for the anointing of the Holy Spirit and early and latter rain power. I believe that we're living in the time when God wants to pour out his spirit. Do you believe that? And brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. We're going to have a good time as we go into the word of God this morning. And even this evening, we're going to talk about preparation for the final crisis. We have some things to show you how we are at the end of time. Amen. And you know, when I came to Heartland 20 years ago, I thought that the Lord was going to come back way before this time, but God has extended the time in order to get us ready for his soon appearing, and I thank God for that. And brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that God can make us ready right now. Amen? Ellen G. White says that if you are right with God today, you are ready if Christ should come today and we're going to have a good time and we'll have a booth up set up sometime today. We'll have our DVDs and books available for those that want to purchase um, some powerful truth for literature, which will bless your soul for Jesus. Are you ready for an explosion today? Are you ready for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Are you ready for God to open up the windows of heaven and shower upon us his spirit in early and latter rain power? Well, let's get this um, kneel in silent prayer, and we want to ask that we will kneel, and the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And for those that are able to kneel, if you're not able to kneel for whatever reason, we do understand. And we just want you to pray silently and ask God to forgive you, pardon you of your sins, and ask God to pour out the showers of the early and latter rain on this meeting. And then I'll close. Father in heaven, we come before you, Lord, in humility. But we come before you, Lord, on bending knees, asking you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. We ask that you will clothe us right now with the robe of your righteousness, Lord. And we pray for the showers of the early and latter rain to fall upon us, Lord God. And as we talk about will the real seven-day Adventists please stand up. May your divine spirit illuminate your word. Now, Father, you said where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there in the midst. So, Father, we claim that promise that you will come in the midst of us in the power and the enlightenment of the early and latter rain. May we see Jesus, Lord. May Jesus be enthroned in our hearts, Lord, and give us your grace, give us your power, and give us your glory. We want to say thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. 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 Isn't it wonderful to be on your knees? Amen. Sad to say there were some people that were on their knees last night getting arrested. Are you with me? But thank God that we're on our knees every day getting arrested by God's love, amen? And to where God can throw us into the jailhouse of love and by the grace of God, I wanna serve a life sentence with Jesus. What do you say out there? Amen, praise God. 
because he suffered a death penalty for me. Now, the Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to talk about, will the real Seventh-day Adventist please stand up? You know, I thank God that he is in control of his church. Amen? We are told that it may appear as about to fall, but we are told that it will not fall. We are told that it will remain while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. We are told that this is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. Do you understand this right here? Just when things seem like it was going to go further to the left, if you know what I'm talking about. Brothers and sisters, God put a man as a GC president by the name of Elder Ted Wilson. Now, we understand that one man can't stop all what's going on in God's church, but I thank God that God is in control, and he just wants to show his people that I'm going to take over the reins. Brothers and sisters, we are living in the most serious time of this earth's history. You know, you see the, the thing here called Leaping Compromise. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like a book called Creeping Compromise, right? Well, if Elder Cruz is alive today, he would probably change the title to Leaping Compromise because it's not creeping anymore. It's leaping all throughout the Seven Day Adventist Church. And brothers and sisters, uh, we want to talk about what's getting ready to happen and how we're to prepare for what's getting ready to happen. We are told that we must prepare for what is soon to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise. We're going to talk about this tonight as we deal with preparation for the final crisis. The Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, do you have it? The Bible says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, let me ask you this. When the Spirit speaks, should we listen? You know, there's a commercial back in the 80s when it says, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Well, I have to differ with that. When the Holy Spirit talks, are you with me? The people of God should listen. What do you say out there? The Bible says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. What kind of times? Now, are we living in the latter times? I mean, do you, can we agree that we're living in the last days? that probation is about to close, that Jesus is getting ready to finish the atonement in the most holy place. Do you, you agree with that, right? Amen. Amen. So we know that we're living in the latter times. So what the boss of Paul is getting ready to say, we can take it to the bank that it's getting ready to happen right now. The Bible says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the wind. The faith, the true faith, the true faith as it is in Jesus. The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the word of Jesus. The faith of Jesus and brothers and sisters, that faith of Jesus not only embraces the righteousness by faith message, but it also embraces everything we hold dear as seven day Adventists. Would you agree with that, right? So what happens is the Bible makes it very plain that the many will depart from the faith, the Bible says, giving heed to seducing what? Spirits. Now, can we agree that right now we're living in a day when demonic spirits are seducing people into sin and false doctrine? Oh, I mean, I'm telling you now, with this homosexual movement that is rampant around the world today, I mean, you better not say anything against um, homosexuality no more or you're going to be in trouble with man. But the Bible still says that thou shalt not lie with mankind as a womankind. Amen. We still hold on to the word of God, right? We still believe that marriage is between a man and a woman in a monogamous Christian relationship. Am I right or wrong? And we reject what the president of this country said by him, by him stating that gay marriage is not weakened families, it strengthens families. Brothers and sisters, whatever goes against the word of God weakens everything. What do you say out there? And you can see what's going on right now to where they're having gay-friendly television shows, gay-friendly commercials now for cars, for everything now. Everything is getting so infeminate now. Even now where two of the most famous um, news anchor people People have openly declared themselves to be gay, talk show hosts. I mean, it is, we are living in the last days. What do you say out there? And brothers and sisters, right now, this same thing is entering into the church. Do you understand what I'm talking about? A recent denomination just voted on allowing and blessing same-sex marriages in their denomination. Is that serious, brothers and sisters? And people say, well, you know, it's not a church. It's not, it's a, we can't impose our beliefs on other people, but guess what? They're imposing theirs on us. And the time may come where we may be forced to marry. Are you with me? Gay, or at least ask to for, be forced to marry gay people. Uh, if we don't do it, we'll get our 501c status taken away from our churches and stuff like that. We hope that, we hope that, that day will not come. Are you with me? 
We are living in a serious time. The spirits of devils are seducing people into sin. Um, for those who don't know, um, there's, a metro, there's a ministry called the Metro New York Men's Prayer Ministry. Um, every Thursday night, I speak there for the young people. And two weeks ago, a young 15-year-old boy asked me, um, Pastor Ola Tunji, what should I do? I'm 15 years old, and all my friends are turning gay, and they're telling me to become gay. I mean, you're in, in, in high school now. You understand this right here? And what happens is simply as this right here. These are these seducing spirits that are seducing people to think that sin is okay and that righteousness is evil and that evil is a-okay. But the Bible didn't stop there. The Bible says not only there'll be seducing spirits, but the Bible says there will be doctrines of what? Devils. I mean, when I say doctrines of devils, I mean, you must understand this right here. Ellen G. White says that all error is sin. Do you understand this right here? That all error is sin. So we must understand that whenever you see erroneous doctrines, brothers and sisters, you know that sin is there. Right now, there's a big push again for the umpteenth time to ordain women as pastors. Are you with me? Brothers and sisters, to the law and to the what? If they speak not according to this what? Or if they vote not according to this word. Are you with me? It's because there is no what in them. There is no light in them. Will the real seven-day Adventists please stand up? There are many books that have been written on this issue, and I just have to just put my two cents in. If a woman can be an elder, then she can be ordained. But if she cannot be an elder, then the issue of women's ordination should be settled. Are you with me? They're dealing with the issue of ordination, but that is not the real issue. The issue is can a woman qualify as an elder? Can a woman qualify as an elder? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's look at chapter 3. Because if they don't qualify it, if we're teaching it, if we're practicing it, if we're voting it, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are doing a thing where doctors or devils is right there. The Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says this is a what kind of saying? So it means if it's everything that he's getting ready to say is true, so therefore we can take it to the bank. The Bible says if a man desired the office of a what? A bishop or an elder, he desired for what kind of work? Verse 2 says a bishop then must be what? Blameless. That means that his life should be exemplary. The Bible says the husband of one what? Now it says a whole bunch of other things. Let's stop at that part where it's just the husband of one wife. Now, how many of you here are married? How many ladies here are married? All the ladies that are married right now, can I ask you a question? Name, is there any lady here who is the husband of one wife? If you, if you are a husband of one wife, please raise your hand again. I thought not. Now, how many men in here are the husband of one wife? Okay, so that means that if, that means that you qualify, but you have to qualify some other points as well too, right? So what Paul was saying here, he made it very plain that a, the elder or the bishop was to be of the male gender. Are you with me? The word husband in the original language simply means a male. Do you understand this right here? A male husband. So therefore, when you read the rest of the verse, it's very clear on who should be elders, and that should tell you who should be ordained. What do you say out there? But we need to pray because let me tell you this right here. If, this, if God allows this thing to, um, to, because you know what God allows does not mean he ordains it. Are you with me? He allows a whole lot of things to go on, but he does not ordain it. Are you with me, right? He, they wanted the quail. They wanted the, the leeks and onions of Egypt. God let them have what they want, and you know what happened after that. Let me tell you this right here. If we keep dallying with this thing, pretty soon the move for homosexual pastors. Are you with me? It's going to come right down the lane. Do you understand this right here? That's the reason why we must pray and we must fast and we must fight, not against a man, but against the principalities and the powers. And our greatest weapon is the power of prayer. What do you say out there? Will the real seven-day Adventists please stand up? There's many doctors of devils. Do you know that this church has not recovered from the Desmond Ford crisis of the 1970s and 80s? Do you understand this right here? You have, there is a spirit of unbelief in the ministry, in theological circles, to where if you preach straight, unorthodox, straight, orthodox Adventist theology, you are not considered a scholar. Are you with me? But if you use highfalutin terms and stuff and quote from all these uninspired uh, 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 theologians from the fallen churches, you're looked upon as somebody that you should be revered. But let me tell you this right here. Personal experience tells me that when you teach the straight truth and you give them the straight testimony and lift up the standard, students will flock to your classes. Are you with me? The only problem I have at Oakwood is not enough room for my classes. Are you with me? 
We had to use the chapel last semester. I had so many students trying to get in and lives are being changed. Why? Because we use the true theology from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy, which is theological as well. What do you say out there? Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to stand up at Seven Day Adventist because Ellen G. White says, now let me, I got to ask you a question now. Now, I got to ask you this. I don't want to assume anything just because I'm at Heartland, but do you believe in the spirit of prophecy? I know you believe in the Bible, but do you believe that the writers of Ellen G. White are inspired from God himself? Amen. That it was not her opinion? Amen. That these are not suggestions? Amen. That they were not plagiarized? Are you with me, right? Amen. Or that Mary and Davis wrote her books and stuff like that, right? Do you, you believe that she wrote this, right? Amen. You believe that when she wrote this, she wrote this from God himself to give to us as a church? Yes. Amen. I'm glad because if he didn't, I was going to give it to you anyway. Amen. Ellen G. White says in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 81, she says the time is not far distant. The reason why we got to stand up and be real seven-day Adventist Christians is because the time is not far distant when the test, somebody say the test, the test will come upon every what? Soul. Now, Sister White says that every soul is going to be tested. In one of her unpublished manuscripts, she says that the mark of the beast will come to individuals in different ways. Are you with me? So it's going to come socially, religiously, economically, every way you can fathom the Sunday law crisis is going to hit every soul. She says the mark of the beast will be urged upon us. And tonight we're going to talk about how close we are to the enforcement of the Sunday law. Those who have step by step in the church now yielded to worldly demands and have conformed to worldly customs. Now, this means whether you're self-supporting, present truth, conservative, liberal, whatever people we want to call you, if you and I are yielding any step toward the world in any way, conforming to worldly ways of thinking and acting and customs, we are preparing ourselves to not stand when the mark of the beast is enforced. Do you understand this right here? Jesus said, all of you should be, uh, be, all of you should be offended of me of this night. The reason why? Because they didn't take time to be pray and ask God for the power of God to strengthen them in that last crisis. And when the crisis came, all of them left. Even the one that said, I'll never betray you. Are you with me? Talk to me, somebody. Now, you, uh, we can understand Judas betraying Jesus, but the one who said, I will never, and he meant it with all his heart, but he didn't know himself. And what we got to understand is, as seven-day Adventists, we got to come to the point where we do not know ourselves or understand ourselves. Only way we can understand ourselves is through the righteousness of Jesus. And we must allow Jesus to live his life through us to where we go before the throne and claim his victory over sin. Are you with me? Do you understand this right here? In our prayer lives, that's why we're told to spend that thoughtful hour meditating upon Christ. Do you understand this right here? Taking the Gospels, taking the Desire of Ages, reading it, meditating upon it, grabbing a hold of his power, his wisdom and strength, so when the final crisis comes, we will stand unmoved. Amen? Somebody's going to stand because they've been eating and eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus. Are you a spiritual cannibal today for Jesus? Watch this right here. She says... Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and have conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. What happens is this right here. There will be a gradual conditioning of the minds of God's people to think just like worldlings. Do you would be surprised how many seven day Adventists who do not believe in homosexuality had no issue with Obama's statement about the gay marriage thing. Because they're saying, they, they're looking at it from a civil perspective. But let me tell you something, what happens in the natural affects us in the spiritual. Are you with me, right? She says, hmm, this iPad is something else. But thank God for the iPad. Watch this right here. You know the, Ellen's, the writers of Ellen G. White are free now. Everything, praise God. Amen. I tell you, God is getting ready to come back when, when her writings are for free. Back in the day, it'd be $10,000 to get all her writings. Watch this right here. Now it's free. But she says, they will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision. Are you with me? Black being blackballed. Do you understand this right here? 
But Jesus says, if you live godly in him, you shall suffer persecution. Jesus says, the world shall hate you, no matter how nice of a smile you may have, my sister. Let me tell you, if you stand for Jesus and in his righteousness, the world is going to hate you because the world hated him. Amen. Insult. Let me tell you this right here. Get ready for your, some of your Facebook pages to be plastered with people sending hate messages to you. Are you with me? For those who have Facebook. Threaten imprisonment. Now, you know that if we don't, if this health care thing continues on and stuff like that, that if you don't um, comply, you'll get fined, right? Now, if they can do it for health care, what about a Sunday law? And death. The contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. And this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. Then she says, true godliness. What kind of godliness? See, Jesus says that your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and of the what? Pharisees. And we got to be very careful that if we're not careful, we can fall into that same condemnation as well, too. That's the reason why every single day, every single moment, you must be covered with the robe of Christ imputed and imparted righteousness. Are you with me? Yeah. To where Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 555 and 556, that the righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed sin. Amen? Yeah. She says it is a principle which controls the character and your conduct. Amen. Do you understand this right here? So justification can't be the gospel only. It has to be sanctification. And what is sanctification? Sanctification is preserving us in a justified state. Are you with me? To where we are under the robe of Christ's righteousness. And let me tell you, that color of Christ's righteousness is white. And you know, ladies, when you wear anything that's white, you got to be very careful not to get it dirty. Are you with me, right? Especially on your wedding day. Am I right or wrong? Watch this right here. When you have the wedding garment, hallelujah, of the righteousness of your Savior, you'll be very careful not to walk into sin. Amen? As a matter of fact, you're going to avoid sin. Amen? And God's love is so powerful to where the love of Christ will constrain us to where we will have a righteous hatred for iniquity. Isn't that good news? She says, true godliness will be clearly distinguished at that time from the appearance and tinsel of it. Do you understand this right here? So the outward is not enough. Are you with me? And whatever God says outwardly we to do, we should do it. Am I right or wrong? But we got to make sure that inward is just as more holy than the outward. Are you with me? Yeah. Amen. Many a star that we've admired for its brilliancy. Have mercy. Think of the bright lights in the church right now. Self-supporting conference. She says, many a star that we've admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Now, I got some good news for you. It does not mean that you have to go out. Amen? Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. That sounds like Hartland Camp meeting. Have mercy. Huh? So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that we need to make sure that we are rooted and grounded in the Savior's love. Amen? And that divine love operating in us is the only thing that's going to keep us from falling. Amen? All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed, here it is right here, they're not clothed with Christ's righteousness. You see that right there? Will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. That is serious. So the solution to the leaping compromise is the righteousness of Christ. What do you say out there? And so what happens is many are going to depart from the faith because they've taken their eyes off Jesus. Are you with me? Because what we must understand as simply as this, as we go to our PowerPoint, you see that man leaping right there? Is that a good picture right there? I think it's a good picture. Watch this right here. Um, we're in the greatest crisis in the history of seven-day Adventism. Do you understand this right here? I mean, it's gone so far to the left now to where you go to certain places. You don't know if these people are seven-day Adventists or they first-day keepers. Are you with me? Am I right or wrong? And it's going on all over. Because right now, you see this iceberg? That's where we're getting ready to hit, the iceberg. Now, this boat is going around the iceberg. I couldn't find one going to the iceberg, but you can use your imagination. What happens is we're in an iceberg crisis in the year 2012. 
And we must understand is this right here. In 1888, we had an iceberg crisis. Are you with me? She says that the sermons preached were as dry as the hills of Gilboa because Christ and his righteousness was left out. The church had gotten so legalistic to where God had to bring us back on center. Are you with me? And what happened was is that we came to this iceberg crisis and we failed and we've been in this world for many more years. But what happens is we've been wandering for that 40 year journey, but God says in 2010, we're going to try and bring the church on back on center because what happens, the issue now is not legalism. The issue is the other L word. It's called liberalism. Are you with me? Postmodern theology and postmodern thinking. What Desmond Ford started, it is gone buck wild. Are you with me, right? So what happens is simply is this right here. God is bringing the church again to the iceberg, and that iceberg is much bigger now. And God says we need revival and reformation. And brothers and sisters, the issue now is revival and reformation because many people, people want revival, but many don't want to change their lives. Are you with me, right? So what happens is simply is this right here. God is bringing his church to the Jordan again, and by the grace of God, we're going over. Amen. Now, the majority may not want to go over with us, but we have to make up our minds, no matter who is going to uh, uh, fall, who's going to stand or not, I'm going to stand with Jesus. What do you say out there? So what happens is simply is this. This is where we're at right now. We see what's going on in the world. Protection of a work-free Sunday. We'll cover this tonight. We'll talk about this right here. The calendar has officially been changed. God is showing us that the signs of the times are right upon us, and it's time for us to stand up and be seven-day Adventists, because let me tell you this right here. Ellen White says those who are, there will be those in the church who will be wide awake when they see the prophecies fulfilled in the church. May we be awake. Here it is right here. European Sunday Alliance over a year ago. European Sunday Alliance to make Sunday the day of worship in the European Union. Do you understand this right here? Watch this right here. Another one is called National Back to Church Sunday. This should scare you. We'll talk about this tonight. Watch this right here. Will the real SDA please stand up? The Bible says, I am the Lord thy who? Which have brought thee out of the land of where? Egypt out of the house of what? Bonus. God has taken the church out of the fallen churches, out of the world, and lead us to the promised land. But what happens is simply is this. While we are on the way to the promised land, the Bible says, after the doings of the land of where? Wherein ye dwell, shall ye not what? Meaning that when God brings you out from the world, we should not go back into the world. Am I right or wrong? But the Bible says, and after the doings of the land of where? Canaan, whether I bring you, the Bible says, shall ye not what? Neither shall ye walk in there what? Other words, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things which are in the what? Now, that may not be our problem, but let me tell you this right here. There is a problem in the church called a tragic duplicity in the church. What's going on is you have what's called the what? The Christian church. And it has what kind of values? Christian values. Now, are those values absolute or are they relative? relative. No. Oh. Are Christian values absolute? Are Christian values relative? They're always absolute. They're the same yesterday, today, and how long? Forever. I'm telling you how we got to this point right now. We as God's people in the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy, we champion absolute truth. But let me tell you this right here. We're battling against a sinful, sin-cursed what? Society with what kind of values? Cultural values. Am I right, somebody? And those cultural values shift from age to age. Am I right, somebody? But notice this right here. Satan says, I'm not happy to have the world walking culturally in sin. What I got to do is, in order for my triumph to be complete, I must bring that into the way. And when it comes into the church, watch this right here. Look what happens to the Christian values. You see that? They become what? That's the reason why people have no issue ordaining women. Are you with me? Because it's a cultural issue. What Paul said was cultural. Let me tell you this right now. Pretty soon in the last days, they're going to say the fourth commandment is cultural as well, too. As a matter of fact, just two days ago, driving in Huntsville, Alabama, had it on the Christian station, beautiful music. Then a guy had a sermon talking about the need to keep Sunday holy. Are you with me? And took the fourth commandment and massacred it and justified Sunday worship. Are you with me? So it's the same thing. But listen to this right here. These cultural values become halo eyes. That's a word I just added in here. We see that halo right there? They become spiritualized. And people have spiritualized the role of men and women in the church based on culture. 
They spiritualize worship based on culture. Are you with me? Am I right, somebody? Because you're a certain culture, you should have rock music to bring people into the church. Should, did Jesus do that? If, um, if you're in certain churches, you should bring jazz and, and rap in the, in the church. Should, should we do that? No, we never conform to the culture. The Bible says if we keep his commandments, he'll make us the head and not the tail. What do you say out there? But the leaping compromise, which is, called, which is calling for a true revival and reformation, has come because cultural values have come into the church. They become spiritualized. And let me tell you, you better not dare say anything against it. Are you with me? Am I right or wrong, somebody? But Ellen White says in the chapter called The Seal of God in Testimonies, Volume 5, that there will be a little company that will be standing in the light. Are you with me? So what happens is simply is this right here. We cannot go the broad way, which leads to perdition. We got to search the truth for ourselves and know what is true, not because our leaders said it, but because God said it. What do you say out there? Amen? Now watch this right here. We're living in the last days. Let me get past this right here. Let me get past this. This is a whole lot of stuff right here. Let's get past this right here. Let me, let me go back to this because I want to talk about this. When God brought his children out of Egypt, he brought them out of what's called pharaohcentrism, where it was centered in who? Which led to what kind of living? Humanistic living. God said, let my people go that they may serve me. The Bible says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I bring you out of the Egyptian worldly ways and philosophies of thinking. And we must admit that when God tells us to do something, it doesn't make sense to the world. Am I right or wrong, right? When it comes to dress, when the world says dress sexy, God says dress modest. Are you with me? When the world says get as much as you can, get, money, get as much money as you can, God says give a faithful tithe and offering. Am I right or wrong? When they say uh, pass a health care bill, forcing people to make wise choices, people saying, I want the choice to eat the way I want to eat. Are you with me? So what happens is simply is this right here. God brought his children out of this way of thinking into a different kind of living, which was called Yahweh centrism, meaning that your religion is centered in what's called Yahweh in Christ to where it's centered upon the principles of God's what somebody word, which leads to what kind of living? prophetic living. Therefore, we as Seventh-day Adventists, if we're going to be real Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we must live prophetically. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. We must live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of where? The Bible says that the word of the Lord were the heavens made and, by, and the host of them by the breath of his what? Mouth. So what the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing is from the word of what? The Bible says in the beginning was the what? And the word was with God and the word was what? And Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my what? Which is his word. Do you understand this right here? So by eating and imbibing and practicing the principles containing God's word, we will partake of the life of Christ. Amen. To where Christ's perfect life. And let me tell you, he was balanced, wasn't he? Amen. He was the only one who could walk on a tightrope without a balancing stick, amen? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we in this life, as we live and strive to live the sinless life, amen, I must say that, the sinless life in Christ, we need a balancing stick, which is the Word of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And as we walk on the tightrope above the things of this world, we have the balancing stick keeping us from going too far to the right and going too far to the what? left. And that's where we have to be in these last days. Because let me tell you this right here. If we do not allow ourselves to be centered in God's word, we are going to allow even our own cultural thinking and philosophies to control how we live for God. Do you understand this right here? Do you understand this? No matter whether you're Spanish, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Asian, let me tell you this right here. Every culture has their issues. Are you with me? But what happens is the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Old things are passed away and behold, old things become what? New. There was a documentary that just came out called Seventh Gay Adventist. You ever, have you heard of that? To where it was, ta it was trying to make you feel very, very sentimental towards homosexuality. And a friend of mine sent me this on Facebook and said, what do you think? And I responded back that if any man be in Christ, you are a new creature. Let me tell you, when you become a Christian, a Christian who was a person that was once a homosexual, when he comes to Christ, he is no longer homosexual. Are you with me? Amen. Because Christ's heterosexuality, amen. 
It's imputed and imparted to that person to where they can renounce that sin and love the opposite, like um, be attracted to the opposite sex in Christ. What do you say out there? When a fornicator comes to Jesus, he is no longer a fornicator. Are you with me? He becomes pure in Jesus. Amen. When a person that is racist or bigoted comes to Christ, they're no longer racist or bigoted. Amen. They don't think their culture is better than somebody else's culture. Are you with me, right? Do you understand this right? Because of skin color, what happens is we're all brethren in Christ Jesus. What do you say out there? All these things got to die at the foot of Jesus, and we talk about we're ready for the Lord to come. We need a latter rain experience. What do you say out there? We need a baptism of the Holy Spirit and early in latter rain power. We need to open the doors of our heart. Christ says in the Laodicean message, you have, you're rich and increased with goods, and you have no need of nothing, but you don't understand your true spiritual condition. Do you understand this right here? So we're miserable, we're poor, we're blind, and we are naked. Do you understand this right here? But I thank God where he says, I ask that you would buy of me, amen? amen. Got gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. That white raiment to where we'll be clothed, and where the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and your eyes are anointed with eye salve to where you can what? See. Brothers and sisters, we need to respond to the lay of the sin message on a daily basis. What do you say out there? Because going back to this issue of culture, I got to hit this right here because it's going all through the church. What happens is you have Eurocentrism and you have Afrocentrism in the church. Are you with me? You got black conferences and you have, well, and you know what I'm talking about, right? That wasn't God's will, was it? But you know what happens is simply is this. People have allowed their Eurocentricness and their Afrocentricness to get in the way of God's will in their life. Do you understand this right here? On an organizational level. But guess what? Can I hit this right here? In the black church. Boy, I'm, I see it all the time. It's Afrocentric to the core. You hear me? They will have theology majors, majors watch the movie Roots. Are you with me? to inflame them against the white man, if you know what I'm talking about, and then tell them that our way of worship is the right way, and that's the reason why almost every black seven-day Adventist church in this country got drums and they going crazy. Are you with me? That's what has been done to our black students. And you can't tell them anything about pure music reform. They say, oh, you're being Eurocentric. But they don't understand that that drum set they play in that church was made by a European man themselves. <laughs> talking about going back to our roots. Everything from Africa ain't right. Come on. Come on. And then you got the, of course, you got the West Indian centrism. That's a whole different story. I mean, it's, it's, mess, it's, it's going the same way. It's all humanistic. But God's trying to bring us out from that to live prophetically in Jesus. Because one thing we got to remember, that divine revelation and human fundamental convictions will always be in collision. Watch this right here. It will always be in what? Collision. So what happens is it's real seven-day Adventists. We have to die to who we think we are and be alive in Jesus. Amen? To where Christ can live his life through you, no matter what your color is, no matter what your gender is, but it's all subjected to the word of God. Amen? We had to use this as a foundation because Ellen White says, sins exist in the where? Church, which who hates? Let me ask you, is God a sin-hating God? Did he tell his people, did he tell his prophets to cry loud and spare not? Lift up thy voice like a what? And show the house of Jacob their what? Transgressions and the house of Jacob their what? And but yet you have a movement that says just tell them about Jesus. We got to tell them about Jesus. Yes, we do. We got to tell them about the love of God. But you got to let them know what put Christ on the cross. It was sin. Are you with me? And if you really love Jesus, do you want to continue to hurt the one that you love? Do you want to continue to keep poking your fingers on those nail scar hands to allow him to feel the same pain he felt on Calvary? I mean, if we really understand the love of Jesus, we will hate sin like Jesus hates sin and will preach against it the way Christ has called his ministers to preach against it. She says, but they are scarcely touched for, for fear of making enemies. There are people who are not willing to stand up and tell the truth and just tell them this is not God's will and way. Do you understand this right here? The issue of the wedding ring, we got to tell the people it is jewelry. Are you with me? It ought not to be worn. But politically, to be politically correct, 
the pastor's wife has it, the president's wife have it on, so therefore the GC says it's okay, or whatever, the North American Division, whatever says it's okay, but you still got to tell them, amen? You still got to gotta tell them, amen? And, 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 and even now where I teach at, I asked a class one time, how many of y'all going to get a wedding ring when you get married? The majority of them raised their hand. Not because it's imperative, it's because I told them, you've seen your mom and daddy and your uncle and them wear it. But I'm going to tell you what God says, and we show them what God says. And thank God there are those that have come around. One time, I was in my class two years ago, teaching on the issue of jewelry. We're hitting, I'm telling you, I'm taking that bowling ball of truth and striking down the lane. Let me tell you this right here. I was so discouraged by the preview. I said to myself, in my mind, I'm not teaching this no more. I'm not going to lie to you. And then I was in my house, and one of my students texted me. He said, Dr. O, he said, can you give me that text on jewelry again? And I said, okay. I gave it to him. He texted me back and said, thank you very much. I'm not going to wear my earrings no more. Thank you, Jesus. Are you with me? So what happens is if there's one soul, are you with me? We got to tell the truth. She says, opposition in the, has risen in the church to the plain what? Some will not what? Some won't bear it. They wish what kind of thing is spoken unto them. And if the wrongs of individuals are touched, they complain of severity and sympathize with those in the what? Let me tell you this right here. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you ever got a spanking before by your mama and your daddy? I think just about everybody. Some people have never got a spanking before. But let me tell you this right here. Do they do it because they hate you or do they do it because they love you? Love. They do it in love. And usually the mama will say, this is going to hurt me. I didn't believe that when I was younger. <laughs> but now that I got custody of my niece and my nephew, it does hurt me. I'm not going to lie. I, I hate the spank, but let me tell you, if I, spoil, if I spare the rod, I'll spoil that child, right? But what happens is simply is this. Seven day of minutes, ministers in these last days of his order are going to have to call sin by its right name. Amen? And some of you are going to have to stand up in your churches in love, in wisdom, in wise protest, and call sin by its right what? Name. Not being bitter and stuff like that, but being Christ-like and loving. Having the spirit of Christ where we are told an inspiration to where you'll be willing to die for that person. Are you with me? That you're going to rebuke. As Ahab inquired of Elijah, art thou he that troubleth Israel? They are ready to look with what? Suspicion and doubt upon those who bear the plain testimony. And like Ahab, overlooked the wrong which made it necessary for reproof and what? Rebuke. When the church departs from God, they despise the plain what? And complain of severity and harshness. And she says it is a sad evidence of the lukewarm state of the what? Church. They say if you preach against sin, you're lowering people's self-esteem. Let me tell you this right here. The Bible says that Jesus made himself of no reputation and came in the form of a servant. Are you with me? He gave up who he was in heaven and became the lowly one in order to exalt us to eternal riches. If Christ can lower himself for my salvation, I can lower myself for him because he said that he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. Now watch this right here. She says, just as long as God has a what? As long as he has a church, he will have those who will cry loud and do what? who will be his instruments to reprove selfishness and sins and will not shun to declare the whole testimony of God whether men will hear or what? Yeah, I come to the point, let me tell you, when I first became an Adventist, before I came to Heartland, I would debate with people, but I don't debate no more because all I am is the mailman, amen? I would debate with Jehovah's Witnesses and say, you're doomed and you're showing the Bible, you're wrong, but let me tell you this right here, God had to refine me, amen? What happens, we have to lovingly show them the truth, Amen? Where I'm at, I have to come at it at a different way because we're living in a time where postmodernism is taking control of the minds of our students. Are you with me? Do you understand this right here? The Bible says that many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. The postmodern philosophy, have you heard of that before? It's a doctrine that teaches that truth is relative. What may be true for you may not be true for me, et cetera, et cetera, and truth is relative. And let me ask you a question. If a terrorist bombed another, uh, if, the, if a terrorist bombed the Washington Monument and they say, well, you know, the reason why I did is because what may be true for you may not be true for me. It may be wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me to kill people in an airplane or do a, a suicide bomb. What would we say in this country? You're going to jail, right? 
but in our schools. Ellen White talks about it in the book Education, that the same teachings that led to the development of the French Revolution are rampant everywhere, bringing the whole world into a, uh, she says, a uh, revolution that happened in France. We are living in Revelation chapter 11 again to where that beast from the bottomless pit has come up, which is spiritually called Sodom and what else? Egypt, let me tell you this right here. Atheism and heathenism and immorality are running rampant right now through politics. Am I right or wrong? Not only through politics, but also in society, through the media, are you with me? Through the music, through the sports, through the drama, through all these entertainment values, spiritually speaking, Sodom and Egypt is disseminating its values. That's the reason why I hear students, I'm never gonna forget the time where I was in my class speaking against spiritualism and movie going, and we showed that Harry Potter was the devil. One of my students gave the most postmodern um, uh, excuse for watching Harry Potter to where for a second I thought he was right. For a second, are you with me? But I can't, I said, look, I rebuke you, Satan, you are wrong. I had, to, I had to come like that. But let me tell you this right here. We're living in a day where people are justifying sin. You understand this right here? To where sin is no longer sin no more. To where the Bible and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is being shut out. And these things are permeating all throughout the ranks of his church. But I thank God that people like us and people all over the world are going to take a stand on God's word. What do you say out there? She says, I saw that individuals will rise up against the plain testimonies. It does not suit their natural what? Feelings. I mean, let's keep it real. Nobody wants to be scolded. Nobody wants to be rebuked. People want to be pampered and inspired. They need to be inspired to live holy. But let me tell you something. If there's sin in my life, if I got a, a disease that's going to kill me in two weeks and you're a doctor, please tell me. Amen. And give me a remedy as well, too. Watch this right here. They will choose to have smooth things spoken to them and have peace cried in their ears. That is the condition of God's church in the last days. Turn me to Jeremiah chapter 5 for a minute. We got to talk about the condition of the church. Will the real seven-day Adventist please stand up? We're living in the time when people are making excuses because of culture, because of how they think, how they feel, what the world said, what the president says, what the rapper said, what the rock star said, but rather than what God says. Are you with me? Do you understand this right here? Now watch this right here, Jeremiah 5.21. Do you have it? Amen. Jeremiah 5.31. The Bible talks about the condition of his church. The Bible says the prophets will prophesy what? In the church, we are told in the spirit of prophecy that many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. Do you believe that? Just last week, a pastor from a church in Tennessee in a, at a, in a college town said point blank, he, he literally said, in essence, we are not to teach the standards, go have an ice cream party in the name of Jesus. And not tell him about what they eat and all that kind of stuff. So you, you may know what I'm talking about. Yes. So what happens is these sermons are being preached from the pulpits to where I, we, I believe in Ellen White, but she's not God and stuff like that. Of course she's not God. She's God's prophet. But it doesn't mean you ignore what the prophet says. She says the prophets will prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their means, means of politics. They'll politic their way to keep the power within them. And anybody who comes with the truth, they'll try to put out. And my people love to have it this way. And my people love to have it so. My people, his church, his people rather be lied to, misled on their way to hell. Are you with me? Rather than be told the truth. Do you understand this right here? Rather than stand and look out and stick out like a sore thumb, but rather be like everybody else to where it has gotten so secular in the church now to where I've had to take a retreat sometimes. Are you with me? What about yourself? and get away and get my mind together. She says, I view the church in a more dangerous condition than it's ever been. Experimental religion is known, but by what? She says, experimental religion. What kind of religion? James chapter one. Let's look at James chapter one for a minute. James chapter one. Ja well, how much time, what, 11.30? Well, how much time do I have? Okay, good, all right. All right, James chapter one and verse 27. The Bible says something very, very pivotal. And hopefully, I hope you're being inspired today to live right for Jesus. Amen. And let me tell you, as we come for these last days, my appeal to you is to make Jesus your personal friend. I want you to seek Jesus and make him your personal Savior and Lord and friend and master.
Ellen G. White says about the life of Enoch, she says, Any t every time that Enoch was tempted by the devil, he would turn to Christ and tell him all about it. I have a bad habit of when trials, tribulations come, I'll pick up my phone and call friends from a distant place. But I read in the Zara of Ages last, yesterday on the airplane where Ellen White says, you don't have to go to the ends of the earth for wisdom. God is right there by your side. Amen. To where we got to make Jesus our personal friend. I'm not saying you got to open the door for Jesus to come into the car. Every time you drive, he's going to be in the car anyway. Are you with me? I'm not saying go that far. But we got to take Jesus, our personal friend, seeking for his wisdom at, his, at every moment. The Bible says, behold, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Do you understand this right here? The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 27, do you believe the Bible today? Amen. The Bible says, now, she says, experimental religion is known but by a few, and the Bible tells us what that uh, religion is. It says here, and verse, look at verse 26. If any man among you seem to be what? And bride lived not as what? But deceive his own heart, this man, religion, is in what? That means in the last days, we need to do less talking and more praying. What do you say out there, Amen. So man, some of us, we just yap, 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 yap to everybody else but Jesus. Are you with me, right? We in other people's business, we gossip and like to listen to gossip and things like that. But the Bible, we got to keep our tongues, amen? And if we can control our tongue, the Bible says, you can be a perfect man. Notice this right here. Look at verse 27. Here's where I really wanted to go to. But pure religion, what kind of religion? Pure. Ellen White calls it experiential religion. Pure religion and undefiled before who? God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their what? How we deal with others, are you with me? In the fold or outside the fold, are you with me? Who believe like you or those who don't believe like you. But here's the other part, and to keep himself unspotted from the what? World. Our religious belief has to be more than just an intellectual religion. Are you with me? Because let's keep it real now. Some of y'all know spirit of prophecy way better than me. Are you with me? You know the book, chapter, and paragraph. Are you with me? And edition. Are you with me, right? You know all four of the great controversy editions from 1884 all the way to 1911. Are you with me, right? You know all of them, right? But that's good. But if the truths contained in those books have not transformed our heart and do not control our conduct, we're nothing more than Pharisees and scribes on our way to hell. Are you with me? Do you understand this right here? Do you understand this right here? That doesn't mean you throw the books out. It just means, Lord, help me to apply my life to the truths contained to it. Because we're told in inspiration, it's a good book you need to read for your daily devotion. It's called God's Amazing Grace by Ellen G. White. And read the month of July. That, oh, this month has been powerful. All of it's powerful. But this month really has spoken to me. Ellen White emphatically says, in essence, that if we are not controlled by the righteousness of God's righteousness, if we're not controlled by Christ's righteousness by his spirit, moment by moment, we will apostatize. In essence, are you with me? You can be spiritual at 9 o'clock, but if you take your eyes off of Jesus at 4 o'clock, are you with me? You may go and do the most heathenistic thing in the world. Are you with me? So we must understand that it's a moment by moment salvation. Are you with me, right? It is a daily surrendering of the heart to Jesus. Are you with me? That's why she said that experimental religion is known but by a few. Let me go back to this slide right here. Then she says, uh, the shaking must soon take place to purify the church. Now, I got to ask you a question. According to early writings, page 269, what's going to cause the shaking? Oh, you've read the Spirit of Prophecy. Come on, now you know the answer to that. She says the stake shaking will come through the what? The straight what? So I got some news for you. The straight testimony is making a comeback. Am I right or wrong? Because just a couple of weeks ago in Battle Creek, Michigan, cell supporting workers, teachers from the seminary and pastors and a conference president got together to talk about how can we deal with this apostasy in the church. Praise God. You know how you deal with it? You uplift Jesus. Are you with me? And you let them know that Christ's righteousness does not tolerate sin. Amen? 
it tolerates no compromise, that the life of Christ, to where no deviation from strict integrity, can meet his approval. Are you with me, right? When you lift up Jesus, are you with me? And you let them know he's in the most holy place doing a work of atonement for the blotting out of our sins to where every sin must be confessed and forsaken and laid at the altar to where it can be blotted out and laid upon the head of the originator of sin. And lifting up the health message, are you with me? To let them know that when you are in Jesus Christ, your relationship to your, your, relationship to your own body temple changes. Are you with me? Knowing that you are the temple of the living God. And because you are the temple of the living God, I will conform my life to every principle of reform that God gives me. Not for, to add to my salvation, but as a love appreciation for him saving me. Yes. Are you with me, right? To where what happens is you can lovingly present dress reform because you're no longer insecure, ladies. Are you with me? You don't need fake up, are you, if you know what I'm talking about, to look good. You don't need, you don't need gold on your ears and on your fingers to, to give you self-worth. It is the gold and the pearl of great price. Are you with me? The world needs that. And the Bible says he will make you the head and not the tail. I'll make you above and not beneath if you keep the commandments of the Lord thy God. But the leaping compromise in the church has said, we got to be like the world in order to win the world. Am I right, somebody? To where they are saying that the world is the head and we are the tails. Let's cast it to them so they can come to us. But remember, we are told in Great Controversy, page 509, that conformity to worldly, conformity to worldly customs never converts the world to the church. It always converts the church to the world. And that is where we at right now in 2012. Am I telling the truth, somebody? Let me skip some of this right here. I could, I could, I could, I could, I could just uh, be on this all day. You know that man right there, right? I know you know him personally. Let me tell you, when I was in, I was in seminary in 1994, I left Heartland, went to the seminary. In the first chapel meeting we had, the announcement came, the elder Joe Cruz passed away. When I heard it, I put my head down because I knew what the prophet said. She says that in volume five, page 77 of the testimonies that Satan is waiting for the departure of a few more standard bearers. Are you with me? To where the false prophet can take their places and cry, peace, peace, when the Lord has not spoken peace. Are you with me? Ellen White says that the old standard bearers are dying off, but where are the new ones to take their places? Are you with me? Yes. Praise God for Dr. Standish. Yes. One that could say about him publicly, he is not a compromiser. Amen. He is a man of principle. Are you with me? Yes. But if probation lingers, God's going to lay him the rest for the first resurrection. Are you with me? And God has put a president here, Pastor Restrepo, to take the place. Are you with me? Amen. But he needs some help here, amen? Needs some more students here. Are you with me, right? Amen. Amen. We're going to pray for more students. Amen. But let me tell you this right here. When this book was written, it was creeping, but now it's leaping, as you know. And I got to talk about this right here. Oh, what's going on? We'll just keep it at Joe Cruz, right? Amen. All right. Uh, what is going on? Um, I can't get the slide going. Oh, well, I'll just leave it there. Okay, maybe I need to go to the other slide later on tomorrow. But let me tell you this right here, man. This was my textbook last semester, my gift of prophecy class. Amen. And let me tell you, I've had some responsive students were getting cut up in that class. Amen. They're like, I didn't know I could do it. But, but thank God for the truth. Amen. Amen. And you know, it was the reading of this book that led me to Heartland. Amen. All right. The Bible says, remove not the ancient what? Which thy fathers have what? But in order not to move them, you must know what those landmarks are. Are you with me? Am I right or wrong? Jesus says, go into all the world and, bapt and teach all what? Nations. Then you baptize them. Am I right or wrong? And then you teach them again. Amen? And teach them, the Bible says, to observe how many things? Whatsoever I have what? That means that everybody who's baptized, every soul you win, God's going to hold us accountable for making sure they're taught correctly. Are you with me? Because right now, the baptismal vows are gone down to three now. Are you with me? It was 25 at first and 13, which was comprehensive of everything, but you got to really train them on that. But now it's down to three. Are you with me? And the bottom line is people are getting baptized on the three vows now. And pretty soon it's going to be only one. Are you with me, right? We're living in the last days. People are getting baptized not knowing what we believe. You understand this right here? Ministers who are anxious for numbers. Are you with me? Because let me tell you, you must understand something. No minister wants to go to a workers' meeting at the end of the year and say, I baptized two, three, or zero people. Are you with me? 
Are you with me? I baptized 50. You know, they, they want to have those numbers and stuff. And let me tell you this right here. People are so numbers driven to where they are not careful to preach against unchristian practices and habits. That's the reason why lay people, for those who are lay people in here, you need to be a Bible worker for Jesus. Are you with me? You need to start training some people and say, Pastor, I'll teach the Bible worker training. I'll teach the um, new believers class. Amen. Gain his confidence in prayer. And then you can train him in what true Adventism really is. And that's what church was really supposed to do is to, to mobilize the laity for service, not the pastor doing everything. Are you with me, right? You can blame up the pastor, but what are you doing in your home? Are you with me? In your community? And you're saying this right here. Are you going out giving Bibles and doing medical missionary work and to seek to build the people up in the most holy faith? The Bible is remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set. We are called in these last days. Give me, oh, I got 13 more minutes. We are called in these last days like this man was called. His name was what? Now, on, when we talk about this on tomorrow, on part two of this series, we're going to get deep into the ministry of Samson and how it relates to us as seven-day Adventists. Are you with me? As it relates to the compromise in the church. God plainly told him that he was to do two things. He was under a Nazarite vow. And when we as seven-day Adventists get baptized, we are under the Christian vow. Are you with me? Or the Christian Nazarite vow. Do you understand that? The first thing was, was that he was to be a health reformer. Am I right or wrong? The Bible said he was not to eat any unclean thing. So his mind can be clear. So he won't get distracted. And number two, you all know it very well. He was told not to cut his what? Am I right or wrong? Because if he cut his hair, he would lose his what? Am I right, somebody? The hair was a symbol of his strength. Am I right, somebody? To where he had to do battle against not only a lion, but the Bible says it was against a young lion. Now, if the Bible said an old lion, that means he could probably kill that lion because that, that old lion had no strength. But a lion in his youth, that's when they're the strongest. Did you see the thing on YouTube the other day where there was a lioness that was raising a, a baby antelope? It was, but, take them to the water pond. It was being the mother to it, right? But let me tell you, not this lion right here. Are you with me, right? That lion was ready to kill him. The Bible, the lion roared against him. But was Samson scared? No, but you know why? Because he was connected to Jesus. Watch this right here. And the spirit of the who? came mildly upon Samson, and he rent, rent him as he would have rented a kid, and he had nothing in his what? He received an endowment of supernatural strength. And I want to leave this with you as we come to our final few minutes. Ellen White says that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive supernatural strength. That's better than Superman, amen? Amen. When I was a child, I wanted to be a superhero so bad. Get a red cape, run into a box or a closet and stuff and come out thinking I could do mighty things. But little did I know when you come to Jesus, Jesus says, the works that I do, you shall do. Come on, somebody. You shall do also. Why? Because you unite your humanity to Christ's divinity and divinity and plus humanity can do all things. Do you understand this right here? And not only that, we have power to resist the temptations of Satan. Are you understand this right here? To where no matter what hereditary and cultivated tendency you may have in your life, through Christ it can and shall be broken. Amen? Notice this right here. The source of Samson's strength was the what? But the symbol of his strength was his what? Now, I have a quiz for you. And I'm not going to give you the answer right now, but let me ask you a question. Don't answer it right now. We'll come tomorrow and we'll ask it when we talk about this tomorrow. What is the symbol of our strength as a church? That's all I want to ask you. What is the symbol of our strength? And number two, Oh, let me ask you this. What, was, what led to Samson's downfall? A woman, right? Let me ask you a question. 
what could lead to the spiritual theological downfall of this church? The same woman. What was her name? If, if I could offer a prize, which I won't, I would give you a prize of somebody who could tell me what does Delilah's name mean in the original language? That's for Tabar. Some of you already know the answer, but I'm not going to give you a prize, all right? I don't believe in doing that. Watch it right here. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. We're going to talk about what the woman symbolizes, what the lila symbolizes, what the hair symbolizes. Do you understand this right here? We're going to talk about it all tomorrow. Are you ready for that? But tonight, it's going to be hot. Watch this right here. I'm going to stop right here. But let me read you something from the spirit of prophecy. Now, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19 as we bring this to a close. I got to read this to you from the spirit of prophecy. Ephesians chapter 3. Have you been blessed, brothers and sisters? I tell you, I've been blessed. I'm going to read you a statement from the spirit of prophecy that, I mean, you could take this to heaven. I mean, this is one of the most beautiful statements I've ever read in my life from the spirit of prophecy. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, this is, um, oh, I tell you, man, I just love, I love the writings of Ellen White, don't you? Yes. Amen. You know why I love it? Because it leads me right back to the Bible. Amen. Amen. I had to put that in there. Amen. Pray for me. I'll be speaking at Andrews University next month. And, um, and then when we do a series on Ellen White. So we're going we to really do that. This is powerful, man. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, this is deep. You ready for the word of God? Now, as a professor, I have a spiritual homework assignment for you tonight. Can you do it tonight? You don't have to turn nothing in tomorrow to me. Just turn it into Jesus. I want you to, I'm going to read the scripture and then give you the assignment. Verse 16 of Ephesians 3. The cure for the leaping compromise. The way to be a real seven-day Adventist is this right here. Verse 16. That he will grant you according to the riches of his what? To be strengthened with what? That's omnipotent might. By his what? In the inner what? That Christ may dwell in your hearts by what? I want you to really grasp that. Keep this in mind. By faith, not by works, okay? Not by trying to make it work. Just by saying, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Do you understand this right here? And Spirit of Prophecy says that if you pray that prayer, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief, you will never perish by doing this. Never. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I claim the almighty power of the spirit to strengthen my inner man. And when you claim the promise, you have it. You got it. You may not feel it, but you have almighty power within you, the Bible says. Look at verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Do you see that right there? When Jesus, that's right, rooted and grounded in what? So, yes, we need to hear the love of Jesus. Are you with me? But the true love of Jesus is where Christ's life is implanted in our hearts to where we're rooted. If God be for us, when temptation comes your way, the temptation that some of you are struggling with, if you say, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief, I claim Christ. Do you know that you have power to kill that lion yes. in your life? Amen. And they call the lion the king of the beast, right? Is there a king of a beast sin in your life? See, Martin Luther once said, I don't fear the Pope in Rome. I fear Pope self. <laughs> Why? Because the papacy is the religion of human nature exaltation of self above the claims of God. Look at this right here. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Look at verse 19. And to know the love of who? Which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled. Oh, I love this right here. With all the fullness. Do you believe that? Now you got to understand, so this was written 2,000 years ago. The believers back then that were true believers in Christ were filled with all the fullness of God. 2,000 years later, you think God's going to do less with us than with them? It is God's will that you and I be filled with the fullness of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, which you claim by faith 
And when you claim it by faith, the very life of Jesus is not only rooted and grounding in you, but it is reproduced. And guess what? The only life that Jesus lived was a sinless life. But hold it. He lived a sinless life in sinful flesh, in a sinful, fallen human nature. Talk to me, somebody. That's why the nature of Christ is so important in understanding the gospel. Are you with me? To where if Jesus overcame in sinful flesh through the power of the Spirit, Jesus is only going to do is relive that life in that same flesh he was familiar with 2,000 years ago. Am I right, somebody? That means that no matter what you may have struggled with before you came here today, it's broken at the foot of the cross. Can I read you one more statement from the Spirit of Prophecy? Can I read you one more statement? Is it okay? Now, in some circles, they say, stop. Don't quote no more, right? I'm going to quote. I'm gonna, I tell you, if I had all day, I'll quote, I can quote all day long. Let's go on. Watch this right here. This is from Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1118. Are you ready for the truth? Page 1118. She says, quote, this is deep. The mighty power of the Holy Spirit works an entire transformation in the character. See, you have what's called spiritual formation, right? The false stuff, right? But what Sister White's talking about is spiritual transformation through Christ. Making the human agent a new creature in Christ Jesus. When a man is filled with the Spirit, the more severely he is tested and tried. The more clearly he proves that he is a representative of Christ. The peace that dwells in the soul is seen on the countenance. The words and the actions express the love of the Savior. Amen? Amen. There is no striving for the highest place. Self is renounced and the name of Jesus is written on all that is said and done. We may talk of the blessings of the Holy Spirit, but unless we prepare ourselves for its reception, of what avail are our works? Are we striving with all of our power to attain to the stature of men and women in Christ? Are we seeking for his fullness, ever pressing toward the mark set before us, the perfection of his character? When the Lord's people reach this mark, they will be sealed in their foreheads. Filled with the Spirit, they will be complete in Christ. If I got one more for you, I know it by heart. Same page, Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1118. Sister White says, those only who through faith in Christ. Hallelujah, I love that right there. Only those who through faith in Christ, Ellen White says, obey all of God's commandments, will reach the condition of sinlessness. Isn't that wonderful? Let me finish the quote. All those who by faith in Christ Jesus, she says, obey all of God's commandments, will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. We don't know how long it was that he lived in the Garden of Eden before he fell. But notice this right here. When God made Adam, he made him in the image of God, right? In the moral image of God, right? Meaning that Adam was sinless and walking without sin before sin. Am I right or wrong? Am I right, somebody? Spirit of prophecy says that through faith in Christ, we can live and we will reach the condition to where sin is no longer in our life anymore. To where... Whatever issues you have will be eliminated from your character because the indwelling Christ is in complete control of everything in your life. Amen? Amen. Then she says, they testify to their love of Christ by keeping his commandments. Don't you tell me that obedience is legalism. Obedience without Christ is legalism. But when Christ is the motivator, when Christ is rooted in your heart, when Christ is everything, when the cross is implanted in your heart and you understand what he's doing for us in the most holy place, you say, Lord, I love you so much, I'm not going to fall even though I may want to fall sometimes. 
We got to be real with our salvation. Lord, I feel like doing this. I want to do it, Lord. My flesh is crying for it, but Lord Jesus, change me, Lord God. And when you're real with God like that, he's, the Bible says he's ready to forgive. He's ready to call upon all. He's ready to deliver all that call upon him. Let's make Jesus our best friend. Amen. How do you become a seven-day Adventist? Let me let Ellen G. White tell you. Medical ministry, page 49. Write that down. Medical ministry, page 49. The Spirit of Prophecy says that Jesus Christ was a seven-day Adventist for all practical purposes. <laughs> How do you be a real seven-day Adventist? Allow Christ to live that Adventist life through you. <laughs> what do you say out there? Amen. <laughs> And I'm telling you, man, walking with Jesus is sweet. It's a sweet thing to walk with Jesus. No wonder the songwriter said, what a friend we have in Jesus. Come on. All our sins and griefs to bear. Oh, I tell you, we have an all-powerful Savior who's ready to take us in covenant relationship with him. This camp meeting has to be one of the last camp meetings on planet Earth. Amen. 2013, praise God but I'm trying to be in the camp meeting in heaven next year. Are you with me? And it is up to, it is left with us to hasten the return of Jesus, to allow him to hasten his work in our hearts. Lord, whatever you got to do, finish the work in my heart. And the Bible promises he which have begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Christ. But the only way it's going to come is through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I thank God for Wilson's um, Revival and Reformation theme where we're talking about the latter rain again. But brothers and sisters, as I said, one man at the GC can't do it. We got to take what he has said and make sure that we have an individual latter rain experience and we can have it. How? Ask, confess your sins, ask him to empty yourself, ask him to clothe you with the righteousness of Jesus and fill you daily with the spirit of God. And guess what? You are on the right road. And when God is ready to release his power in abundance, you have prepared yourself on a daily basis. Are you with me? Are you with me? And God will, 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 God will exude the fruits of the spirit in your life. Your souls will be converted. Sins will be converted unto thee. And you will have victories in your life. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you, there are certain issues that I had to where it has no appeal to me no more. It's because of the righteousness of Jesus in my heart. Do you want to come to the point where you say, Jesus, that issue that I'm struggling with, may you detonate the power of it from my life. Is that your desire? Amen. Well, if that's your desire, let us kneel for prayer. We're going to ask God to make us a real seven-day Adventist. Amen. And how do we do it? By allowing Christ, who is the seven-day Adventist, to live in our hearts. Father in heaven, we desire to be real seven-day Adventists, Lord. This is a revival and reformation message you've given me, Lord. But there are those in here they're familiar with all the reforms. There are people doing it, Lord. But God, we're not going to take for granted that we believe the truth, Lord. We are going to ask that Jesus, your son, will live the seven day of his life in us, Lord. And we pray that may the life of Jesus be imparted to the Holy Spirit. And Father, if there's anybody in this room right now who is battling against wicked spirits, Lord, in the name of Jesus, release the satanic control, Lord God, off of their lives, Lord. Amen. I ask that if there's any self-righteousness, Phariseeism in our lives, remove it, Lord. Amen. But Father, we ask that you'll live out these reforms through us, Lord. But most especially, may Jesus be our idol, Lord. Amen. We're not going to idolize Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan or somebody in the world. We're going to idolize Michael Jesus. Amen. Father, we idolize you, Lord God. You are, Amer you are our American idol, Lord. You're the top role model, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord. Now bring us back out tonight as we talk about preparation for the final crisis, Lord. Anoint us, Lord, to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. We hope you have been blessed by this message. If you would like more information about other programs or sermons by this speaker, please contact EGN at 1-800-774-3566. That's 1-800-774-3566. On behalf of the entire EGN team, thank you for watching.